I think that we all have resilience within us, but it's really our ability to make better choices. And to start doing that, I think we have to take a good, hard look at our life. In those tough times, that is when we have the ability to actually build our resilience and to build our grit. I'm grateful for every single challenge that I went through um, as an athlete, as a kid. You know, I don't wish sexual abuse on anyone, but after I was sexually abused and I didn't have anybody come help me or come rescue me, it taught me something. It taught me that if I want to thrive, if I want to get better, then I got to work for it and I got to be willing to do the work. Welcome to the Fitness CEO Podcast, a show dedicated to helping fitness entrepreneurs launch and grow successful gyms. Here's your host, Bryce Henson. Welcome back, my friends, to another incredible episode of the Fitness CEO Podcast. And before I introduce today's guest, I want to give you a friendly reminder to give us a like, give us a subscribe on YouTube, write us an amazing review on iTunes, that way we can keep producing this content for you for free. So now to introduce today's guest, who's a dear friend of mine, who's an absolutely inspirational story. She's been featured on the Today Show, The Doctors, NBC, TED Talks, Hallmark Channel, Forbes, and USA Today. She suffered a life tragic motorcycle accident, almost severing and severing her right leg. And she overcame that through the power of resilience and having a strong mindset. And today she's going to be teaching you the three ways to produce, improve your resiliency and your mindset so that way you can grow your income and your impact. Without further ado, Amberly Lago, my friend, welcome to the Fitness CEO Podcast. So excited to have you. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. It's so great to see you again. We met recently in Southern California, but our, I guess, network has been uh, certainly intertwined. And uh, my business partner, friend, mentor is also your uh, accountability coach and business coach. So we'll talk a lot about that, uh, our introduction through Bedros and much more. You know, one of the themes of this particular podcast, and I like to showcase different guests who have certain zones of genius to add value. And certainly there's a lot of zone of genius that you need to be good at in running a business. And one of them is mindset and resilience. You are the epitome of this, Amberly. So I really want to kick it off and really open this up to tell your incredible story, which I know I highlighted a little bit on the introduction, but we'd love to hear the backstory and uh, really fill all our audience in on where you came from. Oh, well, thank you. And yeah, I just have to say, yeah, the first time I ever met you and saw you, you were killing it on stage. You were incredible at the event with Bedros. Um, so I just want to say what an incredible speaker you are. And I'm so glad that we got to connect more down at the headquarters. Fitness has always been a passion of mine. And I was in the fitness industry for 26 years and living in California. And, you know, I was a, when I started my fitness business, I was a single mom. So I worked really hard to build this business up, to build these clientels and to the point where I was teaching a trainer certification preparation course and I would hand pick like the best trainers in the class and I would have them work with me. So I had all these trainers that worked with me, married, remarried, had, I was like, I'm living the California dream. I've got my fitness business. I was doing infomercials with Body by Jake. I was I, even sponsored by Nike. Um, and if you went into any like Rite Aid or CVS, you would see a vitamin with my picture and my daughter's picture on some of them. So I was really living such a great life and everything changed in the blink of an eye. When I had just finished training clients on my way home from work, I jumped on my Harley and I'm just cruising down Ventura and this SUV shoots out of a parking lot and they T-bone me. I get thrown like 30 feet and I'm sliding across the asphalt. And when I finally came to a stop, Bryce, I look down at my leg and it's crazy to look and see your body that disfigured. I mean, it was completely broken into pieces. There was blood everywhere. Paramedics got there quickly. I was rushed to the hospital and they put me in induced coma. And when I woke out up out from a coma, they, you know, doctors leaned over and said, I'm so sorry. Um, there's nothing we can do for you. You have a 1% chance of saving your leg. It's like a war wound. And in that moment, I thought, okay, 
one percent chance that means there's still a chance and that I hung on like that was my glimmer of hope and that got me through 34 surgeries and months in the hospital and um, it took a lot of grit and by the grace of God they did save my leg but then um, and as an athlete you know you think okay it's going to be hard you get through injuries you just work hard you train every day and it's going to get better and so that's kind of what I thought growing up you know I was a professional dancer before I became a fitness trainer so my whole life my whole livelihood was fitness and my physicality um, training clients doing these infomercials And so I went to the doctor thinking, okay, you know, they said it might take two years to start walking again. And I went to the doctor in about four months and I was like, he's going to be so proud of me. I'm standing upright on crutches. I mean, it was excruciating pain. And he looked at me and he said, are you the kind of person that likes to push through pain? And I'm like, well, yes, I am. I've got a PhD and suck it up. And he said, well, you've got something very serious. He's like, you you have CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome. I'm like, okay, well, what is that? He said, well, you're going to be permanently disabled. You're never going to work again. You're never going to walk again. You need to go get back in your wheelchair. And I'm like, well, what do you mean back in my wheelchair for, for how long? He said, forever. And I felt like I had been kicked in the gut. Here I had had all these surgeries to save my leg. I was working so hard to get back to training my clients only to be told that my life would never be the same. I would never be out of pain, that this would be the rest of my life. And, you know, I kept thinking that resilience was I needed to get back to what I was doing before. I needed to get back to training my clients back to the life I had. And I was trying so hard to get back to that and literally like killing myself on the gym floor. And it took one day I was on the gym floor training a client and I'd had a surgery. So I was wearing like this medical boot and I guess I'd busted some of the stitches and I was bleeding across the gym floor. And my husband comes over, he was working out at the gym and he comes over and he said, what are you doing? He was like, this is crazy. You've got to stop this. He goes, you're bleeding out across the floor. And that was my, like my wake up call. Like, how's that working for you? You know, when you're doing something and you're like, this is not working out well for me, for my family, for my clients. I was in excruciating pain. And so I had to kind of stop and reevaluate because I love working with people, but I thought, how can I work with people in a different way to where I'm not killing myself. And so I think that part of being resilient is thinking about other ways of doing things that not being so rigid and having to go back, but it's bouncing forward with an open mind and having the confidence to jump out of your comfort zone and try new things. We had $2.9 million worth of medical expenses a lean on our house. And I used to be embarrassed to say that, but we had, I had so many surgeries and so many crazy procedures to try to get rid of this nerve disease. And I was trying everything and I had to stop and ask myself, okay, what brings me joy? What is it that I love to do? And it was like, well, I love working with people. I can't be on my feet every day killing myself, but I can still work with people because I think so much about being a personal trainer is also helping people develop that mindset. And so I went from the personal training business to coaching. So anybody who's listening and you're like, well, I'm too old to start that business. I'm 50 and you know, five years ago, I didn't even own a computer. I did everything old school. Like I wrote, hand wrote all my clients, um, nutritional plans, exercise prescriptions, everything was written by hand. And so I say, you're never too old. Um, you're never too dumb. If I can figure stuff out, (laughs) anybody can, because here I started this brand new business and now I'm out of debt. We just bought a house here in Dallas. Um, and I'm living, the life. I I, I mean, I'm not trying to boast, but I'm living the life that I always imagined, you know, and it just took me having a willingness to get back up again and again and being open-minded enough to go, okay, well, what's next? You know, it wasn't the end, but it was, 
Maybe there's something better, even better that's yet to come. Oh, Amberly, that is just absolutely so incredible story and inspirational and transformational and um, just blown away. Um, and kind of diving in to unpack that a little bit. I mean, there's so much there. And especially um, you talked about, you know, the disease that you encountered, but really it's kind of quote unquote doing the research before the call, you were diagnosed with what's called the suicide disease. So, yeah. which is just wild after going through that incredible trauma. And you talk about resiliency, which is a really big theme in terms of your coaching and masterminds, et cetera. Um, let's unpack that, um, you know, especially after going through such a, such a deep low where, you know, again, you're diagnosed with the, the, su- uh, the suicide disease you had to have a ton of resilience um you talked about some strategies on how to develop that resilience but do you think this is resilience is factory installed do you think it's something that you can develop with time and i guess really what made it about you amberly that you could actually process this and then turn a switch and say okay i can be the victim or the victor and clearly you chose the victor through resilience so unpack that if you'd be so kind Going through 34 surgeries, that wasn't the hardest part. Yeah, it sucked. It was painful. It was, I would squeeze the the bed, the rails on the bed, and my husband couldn't be in the room because there were some times when they would change my bandages and the pain was so intense. The hardest part and the lowest point of my journey was after I was diagnosed with this nerve disease that leaves you in constant chronic pain. It's a disease of your sympathetic nervous system where your nervous system's all out of whack. And um, I was trying all these different treatments. Now, I had been like the picture of health my whole life. I was never a party or I was always like the success minded, like career driven, like really, really over achiever type A person. I was not the one who was going to the bars. I would be the one collecting your tips, you know, behind the bar. I had never done a drug in my life. And all of a sudden I was being induced with crazy medications, ketamine to try to reboot my nervous system. I was on 73 homeopathic pills, 11 different prescription medications, all to try to you know, get me out of pain and somehow try to cure this non-curable disease and nothing was working. And I remember Bryce one day I tried a glass of wine and I was like, wow, this kind of helps. Like, I wonder why the doctors didn't just tell me to knock one back. Like that kind of helps. And you know what? I thought being in the fitness industry, I thought this is not the healthiest thing that I should be doing, but if this is what I have to do to get through this pain, um, because I didn't really have a lot of coping skills. My coping skill and my drug of choice was running. I ran everywhere. I ran when I was sad. I ran when I was anxious, when I was happy, anything I ran. And I couldn't run anymore because of the CRPS and because of my, you know, ankle being and my whole leg being made of metal and all of that. And so I started drinking every day. And I think that there is a gift in desperation because when I didn't have these tools to get through this resilience, I was playing the victim and I was having a pity party. And I was like, you know, there has to be more to life than this. And I just remember there was one day and I was to the point where I understood for the first time why it's called the suicide disease, because people either were like, I can't take this pain and they, you know, unfortunately in their lives or they were doing, they do what I was doing, which was slowly killing myself every single day by drinking. And so I think In this moment where I was thinking, you know, my mom, you know, my daughters deserve a better mom. Maybe my husband could find another wife and another mom and for our daughters. And I thought, wait a minute, there's just got to be a different way. And I got on my knees and I prayed and asked for help. And it took so much courage to ask for help. Um, from a friend after I asked God for help. She was actually one of my former clients and I knew she was sober and she didn't get back to me right away. And I thought, gosh, I'm going to die if I don't get help now. Like I need to go to like some kind of recovery meeting or something. And so I share that because sometimes when we reach out for help, 
we don't always get it right away. And it's not because people don't care. It's because maybe they are just caught up in their own circumstances or what they're going through. And we have to be willing to help ourselves. And so I literally Googled 12 step recovery. I found a meeting and I was going to, um, from sneaking my drinking to now sneaking, going to recovery meetings to get sober. One day at a time, I started to be able to build my life back up. And that was in two, back in 2016 that I got sober. And I think that we all have resilience within us, but it's really our ability to make better choices. And to start doing that, I think we have to take a good, hard look at our life. What is going on? There are some times in life, you know, we don't quite understand why we're going through hard situations, but in those tough times, that is when we have the ability to actually build our resilience and to build our grit. I'm grateful for every single challenge that I went through um, as an athlete, as a kid. You know, I don't wish sexual abuse on anyone, but after I was sexually abused and I didn't have anybody come help me or come rescue me, it taught me something. It taught me that if I want to thrive, if I want to get better, then I got to work for it and I got to be willing to do the work. Nobody's going to come and rescue me. When I learned to walk again, I mean, at first, Bryce, I couldn't even move my leg. I was wondering, would I ever even be able to lift my leg off the hospital bed again? No one was going to do that for me. I had to work every single day to literally be able to move my leg, then stand up for seconds at a time and painfully start to take one step at a time. And it was the same when I got sober and still, you know, it's not always easy staying sober, but I put the work in to one day at a time, get better and better each day and to keep my sobriety. And I think that's that way. It's that way, especially as an entrepreneur, if you love what you do, it's going to be a lot easier to do it but it's it's not about being motivated and I know that you know Bedros talks about this a lot um it's about having that discipline. And it's about when you wake up in the morning, building that trust with yourself by staying committed to the things that you promised yourself you were going to do. I mean, I have to say this morning, the alarm went off and I wanted to push snooze, but I was like, nope, I got to get up. I got to, you know, get up and and keep that promise to myself. So I start to build that trust within me. I don't, I'm not always motivated. I didn't feel like going to the gym today, but I know what it does for me um, mentally. I know what it does for me physically, but I do it mainly for my mindset because what we do in one thing we do in everything. So if I can stay committed to working out and moving my body, it's going to move my mood. It's going to make an impact on my business, on how I relate to the people on my team, on the kind of mother I am, on the kind of wife I am. And, you know, I've even told my kids, you know, my, my daughter sometimes will be like, mom, stay home. I want attention. I'm like, if you want a nice mom, I need to go work out. But I think that that, you know, that was a long answer for how do you develop that resilience? It's so much about your mindset. And it's, I would say the quickest and easiest way to shift your mindset. When you start to feel yourself going down into despair or sadness, or like you're stuck, or you start feeling like a victim, or why me, is to shift it to with gratitude. And I know that sounds so simple, and it is simple, but it works. Gratitude is alchemy. The minute you think of something that you're grateful for, it turns what you can't do into what you can do and what you don't have into what you do have. And this is something that I practice. This is something that I use every day. I start my day with it. I end my day with it. I have a group of ladies. We call ourselves the God Squad and we text each other 10 things every day that we're grateful for. I would say one other thing to help you be resilient in your spirit is to go help somebody. Get out of your problems and thinking about yourself and just go check on somebody, go be of service. And I've had people tell me, they're like, well, how could you be of service when you were stuck in the hospital bed? Let me tell you, Bryce, I was doing exercise plans for the nurses in the hospital. I was still on the phone with clients. I was still doing nutritional plans 
um, for my, my, um, daughter's aunts, I was still checking on people. So you can, it literally, you can be stuck in a bed and still be of service. Sometimes all you have to do is call somebody and let them know you care. Um, and then physically to be resilient, I really think one of my non-negotiables is moving my body however I can. And I've actually had people go, well, how could you do that stuck in a hospital bed? Doctors thought I was crazy because yeah, I was stuck in a hospital bed, completely bed band, bed bound, had to use a bedpan, but I asked the doctors to install a pull-up bar over my bed and one of the trainers to bring me some dumbbells. And it wasn't like I was trying to get big biceps or lats. It was just that I knew that if I could move my body any way I could, that it would make me feel like I was moving in the right direction. And in between each surgery, I was training like I was going to battle. I was like, I am going to get as healthy as I can. So I rock it through this surgery and I come out the other side stronger and stronger and healing. And so I think that being resilient is not just in one aspect of your life, but it is mind, body, spirit. And I hope just those couple of things help some of the listeners to when they're feeling, you know, if you're feeling like, oh, tired a little hopeless if you can just tap into some of those things to shift your day. Oh, Amberly, there's so much gold here, my friends listening to this. Um, That's an incredible insight to, you know, how to become an overachiever, become a winner, how to become a victor, victor, not a victim, um, which is all just so mission critical to your point about entrepreneurship. It's about, you know, dealing with the strong mindset, resiliency. One of the things I had in my notes was talk about the hopelessness that you experienced, that you overcame. Um, So, so much, so much gold and value there. What's up, my friend, Bryce here. Now you might know me as the co-host of this podcast and the CEO of FitBody, but what many people don't know is that I actually began my journey as a FitBody franchise owner. Now being an owner, I wake up every day absolutely doing what I love. I live my passion, I help people transform their lives and have both financial and personal freedom. It's for these reasons and many more that other owners join the brand and open their own FitBody locations too. So if you're looking to build a highly profitable business, take charge of your life, and create an impact in your very own community, then opening a fit body gym might be a perfect fit for you. Now to see if a territory is available in your area, as we have very limited spots due to our incredible growth, go ahead and visit our website at fbbcfranchise.com to complete an application. Well, thanks, and back to the show. I want to transition, um, you know, as we talked about the, the the heavy hitting content, which is really what's in your ears from an entrepreneur perspective. You know, for our audience are um, going to be soon to be gym owners and fitness owners and uh, fitness business owners, and uh, so that mindset is absolutely critical. Now, additionally, since you were a fitness CEO as a fitness professional for over twenty five years, uh, living in California, if you take a look back at your journey specifically to your career as a fitness professional, what would you say were some some strategies that really enabled you to be successful? And the reason I share this is because, you know, especially is is primarily a male dominated industry, but that's changing. It's changing quickly. Even within Fit Body Bootcamp, we have uh, a dozens of really strong females that are entering our brand and really doing incredible things. So I'd love to be able to provide some strategies from a business perspective, from a leadership perspective that really allowed you really you know, strong success um, as a fitness professional that really help our audience listening. People want to, first of all, they want, they, they're always watching you. They are always watching you. They are, they're watching you how you are in the gym. When I first started, um, I started training clients and I learned a very important lesson that kind of hurt at first, but I worked for another company as an independent, I mean, I wasn't an independent contractor. I worked for another fitness business and got paid and I I was a professional dancer and dancers show up to class in old sweats, torn t-shirts, big baggy sweatshirts tied around your waist. And that's how I was used to working out. So I showed up to be this professional trainer. Once I passed my certifications, the gym owner came over and said, where do you get your clothes? Do you buy them at like a garage sale or something? You look so unprofessional. And I was like, oh, you know, I mean, I was, I was like 20, 
25 years old and I was like, oh, I was, I looked like a dancer going in to take a hip hop class. And after that, I didn't have much money, but I took the money I had and I went and bought two really professional, beautiful matching, like the Adidas jacket and pants. Like I looked super professional and I just lived at the gym. I was there. I, I asked the front desk if, you know, I said, can I offer any free walkthroughs, training sessions to brand new members? People saw me in the gym all the time. When I was out of the gym, I was a representation of fitness. I was, people would look at me and come up to me and say, oh, are you a trainer? Because I, and this was also before everybody wore a lot of yoga pants and stuff. So I was always in workout clothes, but I think it's really important to be a walking billboard and representation. You are your brand and people want to, they want what you've got. So I think it's really important to practice um, what you preach, what you're telling your clients. And for me, I didn't believe in going in the gym and eating donuts in the gym when I'm telling my clients don't eat donuts. And so like pretty simple things that, you know, a lot of people maybe think that their people are not watching. People are always watching you. And believe it or not, I got so many clients by starting up conversations with people in line at the grocery store, being in line at Starbucks, being in line for the teller at the bank where people would just come up to me and start asking me questions. And lo and behold, they would become a client of mine. So that was very helpful. But I do, I do want to share that, you know, after my accident, I really, I lost a lot of my confidence because when I was training at the height of my career, I was like the fastest runner at the gym. I trained people that were getting ready for their CHP test. I would put them in and condition them to get them ready for the CHP. I would hold mitts for the biggest fighters. I trained um, fitness competitors, male fitness competitors. And I prided myself in lifting out with the, you know, heavyweights, the big buff guys at the gym. And um, I was known for my legs. And now all of a sudden i had lost 20 pounds of muscle. I'm completely deformed from the hip down. I felt broken as a trainer and I thought, who's going to want to work with me? And to my surprise, I went back into the gym and my clientele boomed when I said I'm officially able to train clients again. And the reason was people saw me in the gym working out in my wheelchair. Then they would see me in the gym on my crutches. Then they'd see me back in my wheelchair. Then they'd see me limping around. They'd see me get out of my wheelchair and do some tricep pushdowns and get back in. And they said, when I see you and all you've pushed through and what you've achieved, that gave me hope and motivation that I too could achieve it and I would have no excuses. And so here I felt broken, but what I realized was I was setting an example that anybody could overcome challenges, whether it was weight loss, weight gain. I mean, I, my, my weight went from dropping 20 to being up on the scale for 20, 20 pounds. I mean, it was, I was all over the place, but I was figuring out and people saw that. Um, my clientele really boomed. And then one other thing is um, my, my, one of my clients who recently passed away, she was so amazing. And I had her for over 20 years. And she said to me, Amberly, you're a much better trainer now because now you understand my pain more. And I think that as trainers, when we can understand our clients and when they know how much we care and we really put a lot into like keep keeping ourselves educated and informed and so we can bring creativity to their workouts um, to, so we can always inspire them. But ultimately, so that they know that we care, that we are in this with them, then that's how I think we have a thriving, successful business. 
so much gold there. And uh, the way I would describe what you just led about being in the trenches, leading by example. Um, I'm a huge student of leadership, and you're probably familiar with many of his books. John Maxwell, uh, New York Times bestselling. I'm speaking at an event with him and get to meet him for the first time in January. I'm that like, is unbelievable and i am can you believe that i'm kind of like, dying he's a hero of mine from afar and no better do person. you want to come oh i will be there in a second if the invite is there 100 percent um honestly i'm so happy and proud of you because he talks about a concept of moral authority which is the first time i heard this in his book leadership a few years ago and it was about you know connecting and leading and showing by example and the fact that you don't need to be perfect with human nature we all think that we need to be this perfect symbol that everyone looks up to. And the fact of the matter is, yes, you need credibility as a coach, but you also need connection. And what you just demonstrated was moral authority. You walked your talk, and then you were able to connect with clients at a deeper level, have that empathy, which you referred to. And now, not only have you, you came across this, overcome all these adversities and challenges, and now you're speaking at a John Maxwell event. You get to see John Maxwell himself as a personal hero. So that is absolutely incredible. Hats off. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, seriously, who would have ever thought, I mean, if I can like literally turn my coaching client, like flip everything over and now I have this mastermind that I love and I get to go and do these speaking events. If I can do that, literally, if you put your heart into what you're doing and you care and you just every day you're willing to get up and do the work, anything is possible. Well, on that invite, I certainly am there if there's an opportunity, but uh, regardless. I'm serious. I'm actually going to meet the event planner right after this and I'm going to see okay can you give me some tickets like <laughs> give me the scoop well I won't hold you to it I know it's a big thing but if there's any opportunity my butt is on a plane to Texas to, to come see you shine well Amberly, the last big bullet point that I want to hit we just actually it was the coaching and the topic of coaching and I just was actually featured on a co- podcast earlier today just about the difference between a trainer and a coach and how a coach has genuine care and can you know concern and connection with their clientele um, you went from a, an incredible incredibly strong fitness coach now to a life coach with your own podcast and masterminds and workshops Um, I'm curious from your perspective how would you define coaching in your lens and really how has it benefited you in your life because we share uh, a same common business coach in Bedros Cooley who's also the co-host of this show so we'd love to hear in your own words what coaching is to you the value that you've received from it and really the value that you provide your audience oh my goodness well I think that I think that everybody needs a coach. And I mean, if you, I think it's great accountability and look, I'm not saying that go out and just spend a bunch of money on a coach. Like if you don't have the money, there's plenty of opportunity to, you know, at first start with someone that can help you stay accountable. But I think, I I believe in masterminds. I believe in coaching. I believe, look, I'm, I'm kind of, it takes a lot for me. (laughs) I've got a sponsor, I've got a coach, I've got a mentor, I'm in a mastermind and let's say, oh, and I have a therapist, you know, it's, but I, I want to continue to grow and get better. And I think that it's so important to have a coach and have someone who has already done the things they, they are knowledgeable. And my friend Greg Reed says this, seek counsel, not opinion. Because there are so many people out there that you can see online and they look like they're the expert and they can say anything. But what have they, what, what is their background? What have they actually achieved? And so for me, I want a coach that has already, like they are ahead of where I want to go. Like I, like I know I chose to work with Bedros because I'm like, okay, I've known him for years. I trust him. Um, and I want, I I admire and respect all that he's achieved with his level of entrepreneurship and what he has built. He is like living proof, like he's the, the male version of what I aspire to, to do and be. I mean, he's, you know, he's amazing. If you can't tell, I think he's amazing for me. If people come to me, there's sometimes people have come to me and there has been someone that has come to me and, um, it was one of my previous fitness clients and their daughter was suicidal. 
And I'm sorry, I said, I'm sorry that's out of my scope of practice. Like that's, I'm not a therapist, I'm a coach. I ask really good questions. I can see so much potential and show you the potential that you have as a coach. But again, I'm, I'm not like uh, that kind of therapist. And I think there are also different kind of, of coaches. Um, for me, I think, and I tell people right up front, I think you have to know what your values are. For me, honesty is the most important thing. And I really, I'm like, I am going to be brutally honest. I want you to be honest. And I think that's how we get to point A to point B a lot faster. And the reason... I chose Bedros to coach with is because I like it when you give it to me straight. I don't want you to sugarcoat anything. Tell me what I'm doing wrong so I can improve it. And I think that it's the job of your coach to really see where, what needs, you know, improvement, not to be your constant cheerleader, um, but to really show you where you can improve. There's also a lot to unpack there, which I'll kind of share in the, in the acknowledgement, but from having a therapist, to having a sponsor, to having a business coach, to having all these things, I'm a kindred spirit. I have the exact same. Um, so I just want to reaffirm what you've just been, you know, kind of communicating. And also too, we also have the same business coach, which is absolutely incredible. So I know. Kindred spirits, I tell you. I know. We were just talking. talking, We were talking before we even started recording, and we were like, me too, me too, yes. You know, California transplants, lived here for a couple decades, have a Tesla, love fitness, have a resilient mindset, um, just a lot of of things in common. But um, Amberly, you've been amazing. I still have a few more minutes with you uh, to be able to provide some last minute value bomb uh, in this form of a light you around for our audience if you're up for it yes all right let's and Bryce I can't wait to have you on my podcast just so I can talk to you again well I'm dying as well uh, I think it's <laughs> going to be absolutely incredible so very excited as well um, all right Miss Amberly here we go lightning question or lightning round you know short punchy answers to you know some good uh, questions that will provide more feedback and guidance to our audience first is what is your biggest passion today you're a passionate person what's your di- biggest passion today and why Oh, well, I have to say my biggest passion for the first time since I was a professional dancer and got to be on stage with MC Hammer, um, I think I was just like, wow, when I got to do my kickoff meetup for my Unstoppable Life Mastermind for these women entrepreneurs that are that we all came together from all over the country. Bryce, it was the first time in so long that I was like, I love what I do. This is amazing. And I mean, I get to do amazing things. Like I get to share the stage. I got to share the stage with Bedros. That's how I met B. But I, and I'd love doing that. I love speaking, but I loved my mastermind. I love cultivating this beautiful community of women that collaborate and support each other. Um, So that is what I'm most passionate about right now. Heck yeah. Next question, um, what is your zone of genius? What is your unique gift that uh, God gave you for for you to share with the world? Well, my my husband says, God just keeps spitting you back out. He, He goes, you just won't die. And I think my, maybe my unique superpower or gift is that I am resilient. Like I, I have that default, like mind of always thinking about, well, okay, this didn't work. Maybe it'll work this way. And I always get back up. I fall a lot, but I always get back up. It's that resilience in you, which is incredible. Um, what would you say to your former self? Even before your accident, when you're 38 years young, um, there had to be something in your way um, that, you know, if you look back, that you overcame. Uh, what would you say, say that one thing that was holding you back in your youth uh, was that you overcame and how'd you do it? I would say that I did not listen to my gut and trust myself the way that I should have. And um, I think that comes from you know, like some trauma and being sexually abused, you learn kind of not to trust your gut. And the way I have learned um, to trust my gut and listen to my gut more is by uh, pausing and asking myself better questions. It's also been with uh, 
working with a sponsor and talking things out with someone I trust and having her go, nope, your gut's right. And then little by little, you start to trust yourself. And you know, that's a thing. Your gut, your gut never lies. Your head will tell you stuff. Your heart will pull on you. But your gut is, my gut has never been wrong. I think it's really important to listen to your gut or maybe some people call it intuition, but like your gut never lies. And that is so important as a strong female entrepreneur, strong male entrepreneur, especially when so many decisions are at your table on a day-to-day basis. Um, you know, trusting that gut, that intuition is mission critical. A couple more for you. Um, you're in the business of giving great coaching advice from fitness coaching to now life coaching and serving many incredible entrepreneurs and women uh, that you touch. What would you say is one of the best pieces of advice you've ever received and why? I would say the best piece of advice is is stay open to the possibilities. Um, And I would say something that's really, really important to me anyway, and I think that it's gotten me really far, is that I am so, I stay humble and I stay so grateful and, and I don't ever take for granted what a blessing it is to be asked to do things like this, to get here to and get to be with you. Um, and so I am always so grateful when I get opportunities like this, getting to be on your incredible show, getting asked to speak at an event or getting to work with a client. It's always, there's, you know, people's time is so valuable. And so I think to stay grateful, um, and show up and give it your all is really important. And and that's, I think that's carried me far. From a content perspective, would love for you to be able to provide some takeaways. And I always like to ask for what's your best book recommendation or podcast recommendation. And I'm going to say outside of your book and podcast called True Grit and Grace, uh, which I would highly recommend. I have not read a copy, but it's on my reading list. Um, so I want to give you a shameless plug because I just love what well, you Well, there's one for. and th- thank you. There, Bedros has a copy of True Grit and Grace in his office. I saw it in there. Okay, well that's mine now. At least I'm gonna I'm gonna rent it from him. So aside from True Grit and Grace, what's been an incredible podcast or a book or some piece of learning that's really helped you in your journey that would be very valuable to our audience? Gosh, I have a whole list of books. I have to say, you know, I, I'm just looking at the books I have sitting on my desk right here. And I actually really loved um Man Up, Bedros's book. I loved it. I mean, I read it. And I listened to it on Audible, and I really like it. I also like Soundtracks by John Acuff. Have you read that book? No, I haven't even heard of it. Soundtracks? It, yeah, John Acuff. He's hilarious. I would recommend the Audible version because he gives you extras in the Audible version. He was on my podcast. He's amazing. And he is just funny. He like tells these stories and stuff, and he talks to you, and you feel like he's talking to you in the Audible book, you know? Um, and as far as podcast, um, I love Ed Milet. I'm, he's going to be at speaking at the event with me in January. And I really like, he, I like his podcast because he, you can tell he puts so much into really looking into his guests. And so it's not like, Oh, got to get this done. Like he really, it's, he cares. It seems like he cares. He's also really fun to interview. He was on my podcast and he was shocked. I did some really some stalking and I had some questions. He's like, how did you know that? I'm like, I told you I was stalking you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, interestingly enough, he's one of my favorite podcasts as well. And I was just about to inquire because I was like, I've seen some sort of shorter thumbnail with you uh, interviewing together. So good on you. That's incredible. All right, Miss Amberly, this has been so much fun. I know I've gotten so much value, which also means our audience have as well. And I have one final question for you, which is really uh, just your parting piece of advice and wisdom. You've had an incredible amount of life experience, business experience, adversity, overcoming, resilience experience, if you will. Um, So I'm looking from the lens uh, of an audience member who's listening to this and they know they're meant for something more. They know they have a deeper purpose and, you know, to unlock and whether it's a coaching business, a fitness business, but for whatever reason, there's something standing in their way of holding them back. What would your parting piece of wisdom to uh, be for that person? I would say, you know, a, a lot of times I get... I kind of get in my head and I start thinking, oh, I'm just not good enough. Who do I think I am? Who who cares? Like, who's going to care about 
reading my book or listening to my show or what, and, and it's all my limiting beliefs. It's that, you know, I've got like two personalities, one that's like the biggest cheerleader and the other one that's just trying to take, that's trying to take me down. And whenever I get in a place like that, that imposter syndrome where I don't feel good enough or I feel stuck, I always think about, well, why is it that I'm doing what I'm doing and that it's not about me. It's about the people that I serve. So I would encourage your listeners, if you're listening to this and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Think about what is that burning desire that you have that you're like, it's just, it's, it's back no matter what you're doing and where you're going, you have that burning in your soul to do that thing that you've always wanted to do, whether it's a coaching business or opening a gym or starting a podcast or writing a book and think about why you started. Sometimes, you know, I don't, I don't think we get burnout or feel stuck because we do what we're doing. I think it's because we forget why we're doing what we're doing. Well, Miss Amberly, this has been incredible. Before we sign up for today, or sign off, I should say, where can I audience find you in terms of your podcast and your site? We'd love for you to continue to stay connected and serve our audience as you've done a fabulous job today. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, please reach out to me. AmberlyLago.com is where you can find the book, the podcast. You'll be able to see Bryce's episode. Uh, Bedros has been on the show too. Amberly Lago Motivation. I mostly hang out on Instagram or you can text me. If you want, you can get the free downloadable playbook. Just text me the word GRIT, G-R-I-T, to 818-214-7378. And just that word, and it'll send you the free download. And then it's me texting back. So if you want to say hi, hey, heard y'all, you know, you and Bryce text me and it's me texting back. So I'd be happy to hear from you. And um, Bryce, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's so much fun talking with you. Oh, the pleasure is mine. Before we wrap today, I just want to take a second to acknowledge you, um, how you show up, who you are. You're such a genuine salt of the earth uh, person with all this incredible success, so much gold in terms of your stories. Um, You are truly the definition of grit and grace, and it just exudes from you and the way you serve other people. So I want to acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge you, and thank you so much for being the show I got better and I know our audience did as well oh thank you well my friends I know you got a ton of value like you always do assuming you did give us a like give us a subscribe on YouTube write us an amazing review on iTunes and even better yet drop your biggest takeaway in the comments that we can continue to engage and uh, my friends that is all for today Amberly thank you one more time and we'll see you in the next episode